We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bigniew Wawrzyniak and I am from uh, Warsaw University of Technology in Poland. Uh, and we start the session which is uh, called uh, Quantum Technology in Poland, Quantum Infrastructure and uh, Quantum Computation. Uh, firstly, I would like to I, I would like to uh, introduce my uh, our moderator, Mr. Adam Piotrowski, uh, who is CEO of, of Vigo System and a member of Strategic Advisory Board of uh, Flagship and Board of, member board of European Photonics Industry and our speakers. But uh, the floor is yours, Adam. Uh, uh, all right, so uh, uh, as uh, Richard Feynman said, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Uh, he was uh, mentioning possibility to uh, to manipulate atoms, and uh, today we're going to talk even uh, even deeper uh, into subatomic uh, uh, phenomena on, on the quantum level. So uh, the quantum technology is uh, usually divided into four regions. Uh, uh, fundamental technical re uh, physical research, uh, uh, quantum computing, uh, quantum communication, quantum sensing, and uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a review today of uh, 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 five uh, um, panelists: uh, Grzegorz, Grzegorz Kasprowicz uh, from uh, Warsaw University of Technology, uh, Paweł March from Military University of Technology. Uh, Łukasz Rudnicki from uh, International Center of Theory of Quantum Technology and University of Gdańsk, uh, Center of Theoretical Physics of, uh, of Physical Academy of Science, lots of uh, affiliations, uh, the member of Quantum Community uh, Network in Quantum Flagship, uh, also uh, Michał Oszmaniec, uh, Center of Theor Theoretical Physics in Polish Academy of Science, and uh, finally, uh, Zbyszek Wawrzyniak, who made the first introduction at uh, Warsaw University of Technology. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hello. All right. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, we'd like to, to probably uh, uh, all would like to know where we are with the quantum technology, how far we are from from introduction of the quantum internet to the uh, uh, standard use or uh, when we're going to use the uh, quantum cell phones or uh, our quantum computers. Uh, so uh, hopefully our, our session will give you uh, some uh, introduction to this, to this area. Uh, so uh, uh, first I would like to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Wukash, uh, can you describe us what's uh, uh, quantum revolution is actually. I will, but perhaps need to share my screen. So, uh, all right. So, yeah. Try whether this works. Give me a second. This always takes a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So we are seeing one of your last slides, probably. Yes. But not the first one. Now you can see the first one, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Can you start in presentation mode? In which mode am I now? Let me check. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. We are, we are seeing your uh, not, not a full screen, so we are seeing your. Uh, this is bad because I, I this, this is this is the problem because I can see full screen and and you can't. This is. You have to press the icon on the on the, on the bottom. Yeah, on probably, the, probably press, enter the presentation mode with the screen with the screen at the bottom, little to the right. Give me a second. This is it. It, it normally works by itself. Let me. Yeah. it's always confusing. Don't worry. Always because because so now you can see right because I can see full screen. No, we don't. See, we cannot see it. We are seeing in a in a, in a edition mode, mm -hmm. 
in a presentation mode. You probably have two screens and you share the wrong one. Yes, and this is maybe you should because, stop. because in Zoom you can share either the application or the screen. Yeah. Maybe you should, you should stop sharing, okay. make, a, make a full screen, and then share your full screen. I will. Okay, I will try. Let, let me try because this is this is indeed confusing. I'm in a different place than usual. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's. What can you see now? The same. The same. The same. You should you should press now? the small screen icon. Oh, now we have a, now we have a presenter view. So the other screen. <laughs> okay, this is good. So you are almost. No. Yeah. What about now? Yeah, you should. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. So. Okay. It's indeed when you have many monitors in a different place, it's always confusing. But yeah, what to say? So so let, let me be fast and to the point. So the question I, I'm asked about is about quantum evolution. And it's really good to, to make the third introduction about what it means, especially that nowadays people often mention second quantum evolution. So, so indeed, it's, it's good to have a look why to call it evolution and why the second one. So, so in order to get it, we first have a look at what was supposed to be the first quantum evolution. And as you can see, this very clean description and explanation what it is. It's simply because 100 years ago, people discovered quantum mechanics, and then they started learning that using some quantum effects, you can get more than usual. For instance, you can build a laser, or you can build a transistor. And, and you all know that, that with such tools, many things happen in, in the meantime, so they are essential for, for modern technology. Nevertheless, as is given in the sentence in the middle, so, so in, in such devices, quantum mechanics is there. But this doesn't mean that everything which happens inside is controlled, let's say, on a quantum level, which means every individual, let's say, particle or a photon inside is controlled. It, it's not the case. Just some quantum effects are used, and, and then this works, and, and, and being able to to provide technology which, which is based on that was the first quantum revolution. So then immediately we go to the second quantum revolution, which is one or even more steps like further. And maybe, maybe here it's explained even better. It says that we deal with single quantum objects. So, so the point is that, that now we are entering the phase in which single quantum objects like atoms or, or photons can be manipulated, can be controlled. It, its state can be read out. And, and this is this big difference, which is with the previous situation. And, and the ability to do this, this, this is what people call the second quantum revolution, because, because in such a case, one can think about the device, which is in a way fully quantum, because Every particular instance inside is quantum. It is controlled quantumly, and, and everything is according to quantum mechanics and not only pieces of that. By the way, what you can see here is quantum flagship from European Union. This is, this is because this is the biggest initiative in Europe, and also because it describes quite well and with easy, more or less easy language, what is the point behind all this quantum quantum activities, so you can, if you are interested, you can go to this web page, and then you will find many topics, but not too many, about what, what quantum technologies nowadays are, how they should look like. You can read about principles, which come from physics, which govern that, but you can also read about possible applications and technologies which are being developed, for instance, one case which I prepare to show you more is in applications of quantum, when you open that, there are many applications. One of them is sensing of brain activity. I'm, I'm not working on that, so I'm not an expert, but, but from a principle, like I, I fully understand what is written here, and I hope you can also understand it because it's, it's explained in a, let's say, accessible language. The point is that 
when people are able to control this quantum object, in this case, they are nitrogen vacancies in, in diamonds, which as you can see, behave, they behave like, like an atom. If this object can be controlled precisely, as you can see in the nanometer scale, so it's all quantum physics like the spin can be controlled, can be manipulated, can be read out. This means that when we are able to do this, we have huge sensitivity to the magnetic field because the magnetic field, external magnetic field influences these parameters. So being able to control the nitrogen vacancy we can measure the magnetic field with a very good precision, much better than, than with other technologies, let's say. And then such measurements, they can be, like they are used in nuclear magnetic resonance. And step by step, we see that being able to control something on a quantum regime, we have much bigger possibilities to improve technologies which are in everyday use, like NMR. Let me also mention that when we look at the funding scheme like worldwide, there, is, there are many initiatives like in, in many countries which pertain to, to quantum technologies and its funding in, in next, let's say years, even a decade. In Europe, we have quantum flagship, which I explained you already. We also have Quantera, which is more like association of grant agencies from different countries, all in blue, which you see on the map. And they together support scientists in, in research projects. So, so you can imagine that Quantera is more research oriented, quantum flagship is more technology oriented at the current stage, and they both kind of supplement each other. What is also left, they are national quantum initiatives. So in, in several countries, like in the UK, in the Netherlands, also in Germany, they are national programs which support quantum technology, like in Germany, many people heard about 2 billion euro for quantum computers. So these three pillars, so to speak, they cover the funding of the second quantum revolution in, in Europe. The point which I wanted to discuss at the end, which I think is of the biggest relevance for, for our panel today is, is what happens in Poland and in particular, so in widening countries. Widening countries, like easily speaking, they are all countries which entered the European Union as the last ones and Portugal, because Portugal is a smaller country perhaps more oriented towards touristics. And, and this is why it's in this, in this group of countries. Why then in countries are those which in terms of, let's say the research and expenses for research and how many funding they, they get, they are a bit low performing. And, and the idea is, so Poland is of course among those, those countries. And the idea is to increase like the funding and, and become like a country which is in a better stage in terms of technology, funding of technology, development of, of, of all that stuff. Unfortunately, at the current stage, it doesn't look so well. So if you look at these three pieces and, and think about the widening countries, you, you, you can imagine that in quantum flagships, widening countries are basically absent almost. This is because one needs to start with a very advanced technology Somehow it's, it's difficult to enter, but I hope in the next talks we will discuss exactly this, how to, how to cross this barrier and how to enter this, this world, starting from the country like Poland. In Quantaya it's much better because this is more, say, transnational. Every country contributes, and this is why we can also have a share. From the same national quantum initiatives, I haven't heard about any big initiative in the widening countries. Maybe there are some plans like in the Czech Republic, for instance, but at the current stage it's not finalized. In Poland, currently we don't have such. I think this is what we can discuss in the next talk. So, so how, to, how to start from this landscape and, and how, to, how to make it better and, and how to get success, so to speak. With this, I would like to finish for a moment. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, if there are any questions, please ask them on, on chat. Uh, we'll be happy to, to answer. Uh, but uh, I, I, I know that in Poland there is still uh, uh, lots of happening in, in quantum technologies. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, there are even multi, multi million projects that are uh, uh, covering uh, several, several universities and, uh, and are uh, developing. Uh, international research agenda. But uh, uh, I, I, 
for, for now, uh, it seems like uh, the quantum computing is taking most of the emotions uh, for the quantum uh, technology. Uh, it's uh, related to uh, unlimited power, computing power of, of quantum computers. Uh, so hopefully they will act as a coprocessor for uh, AI, uh, machine learning, and, uh, and process uh, vast amounts of the data. So uh, the first draft report on, uh, on a computer architect architecture but by John von Neumann uh, from 1945 uh, uh, defined uh, the, the, the computers, the, the computer architecture uh, as we know it uh, right now. So uh, uh, how can we then define the, the quantum uh, computer architecture in, in the real life? Uh, uh, did uh, quantum computers already exceed uh, classical computers? Uh, uh, Michal, can you can you give us uh, uh, some some interesting uh, thoughts about about that? Sure, I will try to do my best. Let me try to share my my screen. I have just one screen because I'm anxious for such events. Let's let's check if it works. Uh, you see? Do you yeah. see? We yes. see. Yes. yes, we can. See. Okay, we see it's awesome. Right. Uh, it's great. Yours. Uh, uh, great, it's uh, my great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Michal Schmeinz and I work uh, as a, a group leader in uh, quantum computing group in Center for Theoretical Physics in Warsaw. And today I'll be trying to convey a, uh, you some, uh, some messages about what uh, uh, currently, uh, what is the current status of quantum computing and uh, how Polish scientists are trying to contribute to this uh, interesting developing landscape. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let me start with sharing uh, with you my, like, say, admiration or amazement for great uh, experimental progress that that we had in recent years in quantum computing. So, uh, like, uh, number of qubits that we have in currently available chips is getting larger and larger. Quality of those qubits are, uh, is imp improving. Also, number of gates that you can implement is, uh, I mean, uh, quality of gates is uh, getting better. Uh, you have different platforms like superconducting qubits, ion traps, uh, Rydberg atoms, uh, also photonics. Uh, still, I want to stress that despite what you can maybe hear in popular uh, like accounts of the subject, Quantum computers are not all powerful, like machines. They won't solve uh, humanity, all human, all problems of humanity, especially in near term. So this subject became like a bit, like I mean, you have a lot of marketing these days, a lot of politics involved, and it's important to 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 be able to read the fine print. So, for example, this is a, a tweet from Ivanka Trump. Uh, it happened around two years ago when Google uh, announced uh, uh, its quantum supremacy experiment. And you can see here that, okay, it is claimed that uh, like this experiment, it took three minutes, but in order to simulate this, this quantum advantage thing, you need 10,000 years on a classical supercomputer. But actually uh, even, Few days after the publication, scientists of IBM they uh, let's say reduced this number to two days and a half, and by now we actually know that we can actually simulate this experiment pretty well on a like moderate size uh, cluster, okay? So uh, or even faster. You, okay, you have also claims like okay, you can maybe break uh, uh, like soon quantum computers will break RSA encryption in eight minutes. The fine print being, you need actually around 10 million qubits with uh, error rate, which is slower, uh, smaller than the one that you currently have. Okay, so, okay, some time travel thing, like, uh, yeah, we, we cannot do time travel you, even using quantum computers. Also, I don't, I mean, I, on the daily basis, I work on quantum computers. I don't believe in near term they will help us solve, like uh, address COVID issue. Uh, yeah, that's not fun. Yeah. So 
like how do people think about like speed up that you can get in quantum computers? So let me consider a very simple example, namely factoring. So this is uh, like the problem is to factor uh, natural numbers into prime factors. So for example, 21 is a uh, product of three and seven. And we have this famous uh, Shor algorithm that actually takes care of uh, solving this problem for large numbers. It takes cubic time with the number of, uh, with the number of bits of a, of a number. But the best classical algorithm has this exponential scaling for, for the same task. And here I plotted for you comparison in the logarithmic scale between those two uh, uh, algorithms. So best classical takes some number of elementary step, sure is much faster. Uh, actually for the sizes comparable to the number of bits you, you get in RSA, uh, you use in RSA, uh, the, the, ex, the, the speed up is immense, like of order of like uh, age of the universe, right? So it's a, it's a feature of this exponential difference in complexity. So why haven't we broken RSA yet? And like the reason for, for this is that not only the number of qubits matters, but also the, their quality and like how they are connected. So it's true that you need a exponential number of classical bits to, uh, to even describe the state of uh, and qubits, uh, but once you have errors occurring in your system, the quality of, of quantum system deteriorates and all the magic, all the quantumness is lost. And therefore, uh, like not only the number of qubits matters, but also you need to keep error errors suppressed while scaling the number of qubits. And currently we are just on the verge of maybe entering the region of, in this kind of space uh, of uh, like useful uh, applications of quantum computers. So uh, in the near term, we won't be able to run full-fledged quantum algorithms. We need to resort to heuristic, a bit ad hoc methods so uh, that don't have provable guarantees of, of working. So uh, applications of such algorithms can be in optimization, quantum chemistry, or machine learning, and people work intensely on that. In order to, to run those rigorous full-fledged algorithms like Shaw algorithm or algorithms that simulate large quantum systems, you need to enter this, uh, this regime when you have really like hundreds of, of thousands of qubits. So we are not there yet. Uh, so that's the landscape of quantum computing nowadays. And uh, yeah, now I wanted to pass quickly to uh, like overview of, of uh, activities that we have in Poland uh, in, in this field. So, uh, so we have this consortium of three institutes, ten Center for Theoretical Physics, Institute for Theoretical and Applied Computer Science in Gdynia, and Jagiellonian University. And so our project is founded by uh, Foundation for Polish Science and we focus on those near-term devices. So. Uh, we work on areas such as error mitigation, characterization, and benchmarking of quantum devices, near-term algorithms, quantum machine learning, quantum error correction. I wanted to highlight just three, like three outcomes of our research. So first, our colleagues from Krakow they came up with uh, the fastest state-of-the-art simulator of a, of a uh, classical simulator of, of quantum com uh, computer that will be so soon implemented within Qiskit, so a library developed by IBM. Uh, in Warsaw, we uh, propose an alternative scheme for quantum supremacy or quantum advantage that uses fermions. It has some ad advantageous properties, but in the interest of time, I, let me just pass to the most applied uh, of the areas that we work on, namely quantum error mitigation. So assume you have some, comp uh, some complicated quantum device that runs some algorithm and you're getting some outcome, okay? Uh, some, some output signal, but uh, because 
you have noise in this device, as I described, the signal is corrupted, it's noisy. But if you knew what the noise was, you can unfold it, you can reverse its effects to recover the, the perfect, let's say, outcome of your algorithm. Uh, there are still like problems with those with this approach because you have exponential complexity when you want to describe this noise, when you want to characterize the device, it, even if you want to process the uh, uh, do the classical processing. And now in this work, uh, we let's say partially solve those issues. So we uh, we decided to look for patterns and structure in the errors that occur in those devices. Uh, we use parallel characterization techniques to speed up the uh, like efficiency of the of the characterization, and you can see here like real experimental results. Like so, we we use our techniques on IBM devices on some applied on, on some concrete problem, and you see like how uh, our methods let's say improve the uh, the quality of the algorithm in a sense. Okay, just to conclude, I wanted to, uh, let's say, repeat again that present day quantum computers, they don't offer yet any practical advantage over quantum computers. Although there are still like many, uh, we are in this point in time when there are many interesting directions for both industry and academia. So uh, especially like on the, okay, on the applied side, uh, on the science side, it's, I think, thrilling to try to develop new uh, algorithms for, for those new term devices. And, you know, those processors, they will be becoming bigger and bigger. Like soon they will be of order of thousands qubits. So you have to learn how to, uh, how to efficiently learn how they operate. So characterization and benchmarking would be a very important thing. Uh, so how to, like, in my opinion, make uh, quantum computing pull and stronger. So, of course, some be better funding would be, it's always welcome as we have <laughs> suggested, but in my opinion, also education in quantum computing, uh, broader access to hardware and strengthening links between academia and industry. So, uh, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you. Uh I see no questions um, during it, but uh, what you showed in uh, as the roots uh, hidden under the ground, it's uh, very, very critical to take over from uh, science to, to industry to really address the application domains and implement uh, standards. So I'm, I'm really curious to see it, uh, it develops, but uh, uh, I see a large, large brands that are uh, that are were on your on your presentation. Google, IBM. Uh, I know that uh, there are there are many others uh, like Annual uh, working. Uh, uh, is there a place for a smaller companies to to to, to enter the game? Uh, uh, how, how, uh, so is there is there a place? So uh, I think that okay. Uh, currently, the landscape is dominated by those bigger companies okay although on the european side uh, there are the, the, there is i think uh yeah iqm is the name of the company finnish german company they let's say europe tries to uh, let's say invest uh, in its own quantum compu uh, computers actually like i think the the amount of money you need to put to have actual quantum computer I mean, forces to like either to have large scale investment or to have very serious uh, involvement of the government. And the, uh, and actually those co like many of the companies you mentioned, they do enjoy support of the government also in the in the US, for example. So uh, I think that this is what will be happening. This is what is happening in Europe currently. All yeah. right. Uh, next, uh, Kasparovic Dragos, uh, uh, I would like to, to hear your experience on, on combining both uh, quantum hardware and, uh, and the software uh, for uh, demonstrate uh, techno technologies. Dragos, are you there? We can see you. Yes, I am uh, here. Uh, yeah, we can, we can see you right now. Figure out each of my four screens to share. Yeah. Okay, 
Can you see yeah, the presentation? You choose well. Uh, we have yeah, a okay. full screen. So okay. So my is. Name, good evening. My name is Greg Kasprovic. I work at the Warsaw University of Technology. And today I'd like to tell you about our success story in the field of quantum computing, uh, co cooperation over internet and community, the joint forces to do something important. And I'd like to tell how to make money on quantum computing without building your own quantum computer. So uh, here's short agenda. I don't want to go into details about technology, but I'll show you a few images to give you uh, the perspective. So the quantum computer consists of the freezer and the box. If the box is very important because it controls all the stuff inside the freezer in, and interacts with lasers. This applies to many topologies. Only optical quantum computers don't sit in the fridge, but most of them, including ion traps, uh, they, they usually sit in a freezer, some form of freezer. A much more complex box is needed to control ion trap computer because we have op optoelectronics, lasers, fibers, modulators, etc. And uh, the general the general opinion is that the quantum computer is as good as this control box and the algorithm that control it. A typical quantum lab resembles a rat nest with endless wires and boxes uh, connected to using glue tape. And I'm not joking. There's a lots, of, lots of, lots of uh, provisory condition connections and uh, solutions that simply uh, are working. Uh, by chance. Uh, in, the, in every lab, uh, there are engineers reinventing the wheel and building from scratch their own best suited pieces of the control system that perfectly fits their needs. There are often postdocs who leave the lab sooner or later, leaving magic boxes without proper documentation. So the next postdoc comes and builds next generation control box over and over again. Uh, to make cooperation between labs easier and reduce necessity of reinventing the wheel, a few research labs joined forces and founded Arctic control system software and uh, followed with Sinara hardware ecosystem. Uh, it is a bottom up initiative around the open source hardware approach created by physicists for physicists, uh, which uh, with help of entrepreneurs and engineers. There are many open, beautiful open hardware projects on GitHub to look at, uh, but most of them have failed. Why? There was a lacking strong commercial partner who is able to review the design, produce all the devices, add variety sticker, and sell from the shelf. And it needs to be cheap, so cheap that it doesn't make any sense to produce it yourself. The economy, the economy of scale does the job. So uh, we, the community, he created over various modules. And modules, each module is a, is a product. It includes electronics, mechanics, software, drivers, or including also documentation and test results. Then two companies, two commercial companies in Poland, uh, put a lot of effort and money to commercialize. The project is still alive. We got funding from several sources and more than 10 new devices is under development. Each of them fulfills some requirement of constantly changing quantum computing technology. Some new modules, modules, for example, clean up the laser spectrum, some control cubic motions, the others stabilize the cubic vibration. So the cooperation of nearly 100 people from around the world was possible due to internet, GitHub, Zoom, and many other tools. Actually, the pandemic uh, proved that uh, such a project can continue without uh, any obstacle. Many of us never met each other because the conferences are also virtual. And we proved that it is possible to build the high-tech hardware in such a way. Here is a short example how physicists can control complex pieces of instrumentation writing in popular Python without the need of using nuances of complex DGDL language. And all the approach to the Arctic was that it can be operated by physicists no, without a need of uh, hiring uh, high-end engineers knowing uh, these nuances of BHDL language or very large language. And using Python, you can actually run a sub-nanosecond uh, accuracy control system. Uh, and here's our team, a part of it, some small part of it. Some groups are founders, some are clients, but 
contribute in testing, some design hardware, others write software. So this is a project which is community founded, let's say. So it works in such a way that if one, for example, one institution wants to have certain modules, so it simply pays money either to the company or, the, or to the university to develop, to found development of such a hardware. But in return, it gets all the other work which was funded by other institutions. This is how, how, how that's why it works. So we created hardware. How to earn money? Build a quantum computer. There is too much hype around this in the field. I have an impression that these days, every postdoc who knows how to use lasers opens his own startup and raises 100 million. That's not the path. We are electronic engineers, not physicists. There was a popular statement long time ago uh, in, the, in a gold rush, cell shower. So during a quantum gold rush, cell control system. And this is what we do. These are examples of the systems we develop. Some of them are simple. Some of them are very complex. Some uh, people may say that electronics is easy. Just take Arduino, write the two lines of code that you can blink your light. Yes, we are also using Arduinos in our labs sometimes, for example, to blink LEDs. But most of the hardware we created looks like that about. This is a control module that entangles qubits and performs operation on quantum gates. It runs at 16 gigahertz. It's a lot of, it took a lot of time to design and to verify it and then build prototypes and do it again, et cetera. And this is, this is a commercial product. And uh, so to conclude, here are some examples of our hardware in a few places around the world. But let's talk about uh, a bit about the business model behind that stuff. Uh, there can be four general business models for hardware. It can be any combination of openness and commercial. One of the problems in quantum community is ability to perform non practical operations by the system. In the usual case, the physicists have two choices. Either one can build its own system, and often it happens, or to pay the company to build it. Once he or she needs to change something, one has to pay again for all the changes. So that's why open source commercial approach makes lots of sense here. From client perspective, it's a win-win situation. One gets exactly what is needed and can modify it. Can produce it when some company charges too much, uh, disappears from the market, or makes the product obsolete. But what about the entrepreneur? What are the advantages for entrepreneurs? There are actually a few. The company starts with an already tested prototype of the product. And this product was created as a compromise between many clients. So the company knows that there is a market for this product. It doesn't have to do a market research, invest a lot in R&D. It needs just to commercialize it, rise the TRL from six or seven to nine. And it gets a lot of support from the community. So it doesn't have to hire that many engineers to provide such support. And the product can be a lot cheaper due to this saving. Okay, let's conclude. So we created a complex system, which for the moment, it's uh, something like 70 devices in the pipeline currently being in development. And uh, we use bottom-up approach in a completely remote way using internet tools. Two commercial companies commercialize it. I think even Chinese people are also commercializing it. Most products are available off the shelf. We have a lot of plans and clear paths to develop in future and to meet new challenges in the field of quantum computing. We are now entering the era of ASICs. So uh, keep tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grzegorz. Uh, so uh... Arduino uh, was uh, started uh, in uh, in Italy, uh, Raspberry Pi in uh, Great Britain. So, shall we have a next revolution starting from Poland? Well, who knows? Just use our control system. All right. So uh, make it make it as you as you said uh, available and 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 popular. Then probably everybody will, will buy well, it. It's getting more and more attraction. Yeah. Actually, yeah, we sold over two thousand pieces last last year, I think. So yeah, it's getting more and more. I, yesterday I saw a, there's Action in, in flagship. Uh, there's a Action project where they built a thousand qubit quantum computer. And I noticed that they are using my hardware. So I was right. so proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all, always great when uh, when you, you are seeing your users everywhere. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right, but uh, with, uh, with this kind of quantum computing, you can 
uh, uh, can break uh, uh, any any kind of en encryption codes. Uh, so uh, we'll probably uh, we should have uh, new holes in e-commerce or uh, virtual private networks uh, someday. Uh, well, so I, I, I don't think it would ever happen because already guys are implementing post-quantum algorithms. You can simply take uh, the NIST, uh, NIST uh, developed PQC algorithm implemented in a hardware, and even in when the quantum computer gets ready to break his existing encryption standards, we won't use them anymore. Yeah, I but... don't think they would be ever able to break uh, our encryptions. Yeah, because but the, the, in many years, nobody would use it. You know? Yeah, but the, remember that, it's all, that there is already a lot of stored data which is still critical. So uh, yeah, yeah. encrypting, yes, uh, encrypting are, this it, data is, is yeah. also very valuable. So yes, uh, yeah, there are still, yes, you can imagine some secrets from World War II which are still still still, still critical. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, uh, both quantum computing, but there are also there is also uh, quantum cryptography and uh, distribution of uh, quantum keys uh, solutions. Uh, uh, Pavel, can you give us some uh, overview about the quantum key distribution systems? Pavel, can you connect? Uh, we cannot hear you yet. You are still muted. We see already your screen, not yet full screen. Uh, we, we see your uh, presentation. Uh, your, oh, now it's full screen, right? Uh, but you're still muted. Still, we cannot hear you. Uh -huh. You should unmute yourself. I know this building. This is when, when I made my PhD, but we cannot hear you. Okay. I, I always have a problem with Zoom. Yeah, I, no, we... I cannot unmute this software. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My name is Pavel Mark. I'm representing Military University of Technology. And I would like to share with you some information about quantum key distribution. I will start from beginning uh, because in theory, quantum key distribution is a promises idea in which we can design the quantum channel and we can exchange for this quantum channel our secret messages. And we, we are sure that nobody can eavesdrop it because it is covered by physical law, it means that if we design quantum channel, uh, the quantum state cannot be uh, repeated or cloned uh, due to uh, uh, the fact that we, we cannot reproduce the unknown quantum state. In theory, we have uh, Alice and Bob, which exchange the information and what they want to keep it in a secret. They always know that somebody can listen to this uh, talk and they invent some special um, algorithm how to cover this information to uh, first share the special key, which will be used for encryption and decryption of this message. Here, is, here we have the example of, uh, of this uh, uh, exchange of the key. Uh, this is protocol BB84, like a base of uh, uh, um, which was developed in 1984, but it is pretty simple to, um, to show how the uh, quantum key distribution works. So Alice sent to Bob the previously uh, uh, generated uh, random number qubits or bits, zeros and ones. And uh, it can be, uh, all these bits can be caught in two bases. Let's say we have polarization based coding. So we caught uh, photons in state of polarization. So we, ha we have two bases. 
One base, it shows you qubits uh, which are vertical aligned as one and horizontal will be zero. And the second uh, basis, it's uh, a diagonal, let's say. We have two qubits. One will be minus 45, the zero will be 45, 45 like here, for example. So when Alice cuts these qubits in her randomly chosen bases, she sent to the Bob. Bob has photo uh, detectors, which are polarization sensitive. It measure, uh, Bob measure all these qubits and they can compare Alice and Bob using normal channel, which can be listened for anybody. If they agree that some of bits are uh, read good by Bob's measurement scheme, so they shift the key and finally can, they can find the proper length of the key which will be used to encode the data. And they can transmit this data uh, without caring if the eavesdropper can hear this because anytime in eavesdroppers start to listen to this channel, it, its uh, quantum state will be destroyed. However, realistic devices has some imperfections. We have also limits in the case of light sources and detectors. So this imperfection always uh, can cause that someone can listen uh, us and try to hack this information and finally encode this data without knowing, because this is the most important that uh, we uh, or if Alice and Bob exchange the information, they, they uh, will be sure that somebody can uh, start to hack their uh, talk. So in practical application, the source, it's usually uh, used uh, photon sources. It could be weak coherent state, thermal, single photon or intelligent photon. They code in polarization or in phase. The phase coding, it's uh, more common than polarization. And both have to be uh, equipped in the polarization and phase decoding scheme and a proper photo detector. As a photo detector, we usually use single photo detector. And the channel, we use, we use optical fiber or free space. The quantum hacking, which can be uh, designed or uh, optimized by uh, eavesdropper can be directed to directly to the source of light. And uh, if we use phase and encoding scheme, the source can be attacked uh, by uh, some special uh, procedure. It is, uh, uh, for example, photon number splitting, phase ramping, and non-random phase. Or we can attack detector by double click, phase, fake state time shift and uh, detector control. Other attacks, it's a, a horse trail attack in which if eavesdropper sends a probe light in both uh, sides or only in one to Alice and Bob and uh, uh, this backscatter information can be read and from this information can be uh, encoded information. Uh, now we are uh, starting to uh, uh, our project, which is funded by the National Center for Research and Development. And this is the part of the uh, SAFIRE program uh, of this uh, agency. And we want to, and we direct this uh, project first for uh, design a QCAD system for uh, optical fiber telecommunication networks. We want to build this architecture, which could be implemented uh, because uh, one of the uh, consortium partners uh, company. And uh, we also try to um, focus our uh, development to uh, change security standards, which are only 
uh, directed to uh, a code and encode information. It, we didn't see yet any standards in case of protecting um, optical fiber, for example. And we designed a sensor which is uh, uh, which can be applied to uh, uh, to see if some if if dropper can uh, start to hacking our uh, optical fiber. We start from uh, two designs. We design the quantum key distribution system based on optical fibers, and we uh, working on a quantum random number generator, which is. Uh, uh, another story in a quantum technology, because we usually, if we want to encode information, we need to good a quantum random generator. Now we are using only mathematics and some special algorithms which are able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to build a, a random number enough long to, to code information. And that's all I would like to say for you about quantum key distribution. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction uh, of the quantum uh, communication, quantum key distribution. That's uh, uh, always when there is a new way of communicating, there is a hacking experience. Uh, I know that, that there are already uh, people uh, all around the world trying to to, to hack the uh, the solutions, and uh, I know that uh, there is always uh, a new technologies to, to prevent hacking. So it's uh, yeah. it's always the race. I agree with Michal that there is more uh, um, uh, management in uh, showing that com quantum computer starts to uh, uh, break all these codes than than reality because uh, even uh, now we have the um, quantum key distribution which works with the speed about 10 megahertz uh, so this is uh, i think this speed is not interesting for a community because we are working with gigahertz speed not uh, with megahertz but we will see there are some implementation uh, and we can by, for example, no, maybe not for example, we can buy some system, QCAD system, they are available in, in the market. All right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, so, uh, especially, can you give us a final uh, summary? Uh, are we there yet with uh, uh, the quantum internet, quantum communication, quantum computers, or, or are we far away? Bishak, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Again, again, good, good afternoon. So I will try to summarize all the problems from the system architecture of quantum communication infrastructure. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, we can tell that the second quantum revolution is in the early stages of development. And there is a most significant uh, scientific innovation affecting uh, the data, uh, how the data should be compiled, analyzed, and utilized. And uh, we can we see your, we can see your screen, but it's not full screen. Yeah, it's not full screen. Okay, but uh, just 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 sorry, just just a moment, just a moment. Mm. Yeah, we have five minutes left, so. Uh, 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 can you can you see okay yeah now we can see it. Uh, yeah this, this is the aspect of uh, second quantum revolution and uh, we can tell that uh, the, all the technological development uh, will bring about major changes in all segment of society but no one can predict it certainly whether the blockchain artificial uh, intelligence and quantum computing and other futuristic occurrences will uh, ultimately benefit uh, mankind. So uh, next question about uh, technical aspects and uh, for uh, realistic 
usage of classical uh, supercomputing and uh, quantum computing, it's necessary to make a secure quantum communication infrastructure. And uh, in this integration of quantum cryptography and innovative secure quantum products and system is important to make a conventional uh, to improve this in uh, communication in conventional communication infrastructure then uh, if we uh, look at the uh, um, communication infrastructure uh, we see uh, that the important thing is to uh, prepare uh, qkd and in fact, it's not only QKD, but also all the other layers. So we can uh, expect that the evolution come to into quantum internet, connecting uh, devices like quantum computers, simulators, sensors via quantum networks, and then to uh, build the quantum resources for securely all over the Europe. Uh, and uh, practical aspect, uh, there is early bird, uh, like two phones uh, with uh, building quantum cryptography for increased security. This is the smallest quantum uh, generator and uh, at a very small chip, uh, 2.5 millimeter, uh, there is a, a random number generator, QRNID. And this makes encryption key and security sensitive services like banking, uh, mobile payment, and so on, is the safest commercially available phone in the world of this type. Uh, quantum uh, computing area is rather very wide and uh, there are many uh, branches. But the most important thing are the quantum traps. And in fact, uh, trap tion is the most uh, interesting idea. We making such an infrastructure. infrastructure. And then uh, we should say about uh, some um, system aspect, software, uh, classical uh, computation. And uh, what is important is to prioritize business to impact potential in use cases. So another important uh, questions are uh, parameters uh, coming from technology. I mean, number of qubits, uh, qubits lifetime, uh, gateway uh, gate fidelity, operation time, and so on. And full ecosystem of uh, quantum computers. I mean, services, applications, layer, and system software layer system, and quantum computer hardware. And then the most important aspect for us also uh, support for such a quantum uh, companies. So the landscape is like this. There is no Poland at this uh, research, but the full landscape is much more complicated. So only two uh, quotations that uh, quantum technology is not a general purpose technology and quantum computing cannot solve all the problems at the moment, but the main aim of the quantum revolution is to bring together scientists from academia, engineers, uh, full industry, and future users into quantum technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, we are not yet there, but there is already a first product uh, uh, on the market. Uh, as, as far as I remember, they, they were developed in Europe and, uh, and then commercialized in Korea. But uh, let's hope we're going to have uh, uh, in global companies uh, selling those uh, quantum tools for, for everybody to, to be used uh, for better society. Thank you for everybody for attending our session and, and have a good uh, evening. Uh, Thank you very much Alan, for, for uh, mentoring our, our session. We have uh, less than one minute uh, left. Uh, you can ask us uh, using the chat. Uh, we uh, try to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.